<laughs> Yay. Yay. Every presenter's nightmare. <laughs> we got there. So thank you everybody for being here. And um, you know, this is called the art of healing water, making sewage treatment beautiful, both in process and presentation. And you know, making a slideshow about sewage treatment, I, I just didn't know how to approach it other than to tell a story. So I'm just gonna roll out a story for y'all and hopefully you can hang in there and it'll be interesting. So, so the story is gonna be about how the heck did this water healing plant come to be built? And then how did I happen to be there and be involved in it in any way whatsoever? And how does it work? So that's kind of what we're gonna be looking at here. And we're gonna start in a little mountain village in Guatemala called Todos Santos Cuchimitan, where a friend and I were learning to backstrap weed. And um, with these really wonderful Mayan people who spoke the mom language. And it was an incredible experience. And we had firsthand experience of diseases of contaminated water and poor sanitation. So between the two of us, we managed to get hepatitis, typhoid, and roundworms. So, <laughs> and another outcome from being there was that I really realized, although I had a fancy degree from Cal with honors, I didn't know how to do anything. And those people who looked at us like we were somehow superior knew how to do everything. I mean, they spun their thread, they wove their clothes, they grew their food, they built their houses, they made their own music. I mean, you know, their level of practical knowledge was incredible. So I just decided I was gonna come back and learn something. So uh, one thing I learned was how to do etching. <laughs> and so this is a, the, the little kitchen on the mar in the marketplace of one of our friends. Uh, the other thing I did was I got into the apprenticeship program with a plumbing union who happened to be taking applications at the point I was uh, interested in this. And I got thoroughly indoctrinated in the notion that the plumber protects the health of the nation. And it's plumbing really that makes it possible for people to live in a very densely, uh, very you know, concentrated place because we are managing our quote unquote waste or resource, however you want to think of it. And so I learned to do plumbing. And I realized my very first job was a sewage treatment plant in Martinez. It's like huge infrastructure, just enormous and uh, very daunting. And I also had a little bit of pocket change from uh, being in the union. And I was able to collect some old Navajo weavings, which I, I grew up on Arizona highways and I love I love the weaving. So. And I learned that um, there was a big push to move uh, mostly old women weavers off their land in a certain area of the reservation uh, in order to enable uh, the strip mining of coal out from underneath them. And so this was an incredible, you know, there was a whole resistance camp at Big Mountain to, to prevent the Navajo relocation off of Black Mesa. And this was a real learning about water and power, all kinds of power, like electrical power from the coal, uh, political power from the people who were manipulating this whole thing and spiritual power from these old women who were absolutely committed to staying on the land because for indigenous people, oftentimes their spirituality is the land. It's their relationship to it. So, so I just saw the human and ecosystem costs of mining coal and mining water because what was happening was, you know, in order to develop the desert, sell land, make money off of the land, you have to provide water, you know, for things like lawns and swimming pools. You have to provide power to pump that water away from the ecosystem where it's needed to the people who want it there and for air conditioning. And so the kind of formula that was rolling out was, you know, create a narrative to force Navajo people out of the way off their land, strip mine the Black Mesa coal, mine the ancient aquifer under the land, and use that water to slurry the coal to far away power plants and then pollute the, you know, the clear skies of, of that region. And the outcome was that the water table was dropping a lot, springs were drying up, you know, native plants that people relied on for medicine and food were uh, just vanishing. It was devastating the local ecosystem. And um, the whole area was becoming, the strip mine land was just a sacrifice zone basically. So, so that was an incredible education for me about you know huge infrastructure projects and and power. 
And so it was too much, you know, fighting that all the time. So I decided to do small local projects that's where I put my attention to. So I took on building a passive solar rammers cottage, exploring the feasibility of alternative building in inner city open. And it was an incredible experience and uh, a wonderful little sanctuary that the people who rented it really loved it. Um, the art that I made tended to be a, about water. I, I worked in a stained glass studio for a year after I finished my apprenticeship. And my design was chosen for a meditation room uh, window in a hospital in San Francisco. So this was it. And then I started carving stone. And this piece was called Praising the Rain, She Who Knows Once All Life Flows. And you know, it's an indigenous looking woman who's really, you know, grows her own food and, and needs to have that relationship with rain. And it's all about sort of indigenous knowing that reciprocal maintenance is the key to everything. It's the notion that, um, you know, nature and the natural world gifts up everything, gives up everything we need to exist. And we need to give back. And most indigenous cultures give back by doing dances, by doing ceremonies, by songs, by, you know, really offering incredible gratitude to the natural world for what it gives us. And so that got me thinking about, well, here we are, 8 billion people producing poop and pee every single day. You know, we receive food from the earth. What are we giving back to the earth? You know, what we produce, we call it nasty dirty, and we treat it like it's a horrible waste product. And we don't do anything nice with it to give back to the earth. And so, you know, how do we really um, put ourselves back into the nutrient cycle and honor what our bodies produce and really feed the earth really well? You know, restoring that to reciprocal maintenance. So I started looking at you know people who were actually doing doing that, who were educating people about how we do really use what comes through our body. So there's a Rich Earth Institute in Vermont are all about um, researching how we, we can use urine as a fertilizer because it's an excellent fertilizer and for the most part it's sterile. And so they're doing a lot of wonderful education. And then uh, this company, the Natural Event in Australia. They do, uh, they totally have their system down. It's like they have their shit together. They do, uh, they've done 480 music festivals so far. They have their composting toilets um, that are intended to give people a better experience than the, the usual porta potties that are there. And so they figure if they, if they give people a better experience, then that will educate them that composting are, are resources is actually a really good idea. And so it's a whole educational thing using art on the doors of the loos. And there they have, you know, what happens is they go back to the same festival in the same place every year. So after the festival, they throw some earthworms into the wheelie bin along with the wood shavings that each person has put a cup and the toilet paper. And they just close the wheelie bin and it's basically composting all year long. And when they come back the next year, it's beautiful, it's beautiful material. And then they give it to farmers who have orchards and use it as a top dressing. So they totally have their system down and, and they're educating people. Um, I got involved in the EcoArt Matters class at Laney College and it was really uh, beginning to see art as a real tool for raising awareness and shifting consciousness. And, um, and I, I got on the board of WE, WE which stands for Women Equal Artists Dialogue which is all about women doing art, about social justice, it's about environmental issues, about eco ecological issues. And so th this was a big uh, kind of influence for me. And this is one of the pieces that I made, you know, using art to introduce a new concept, embracing our place in the nutrient cycle, actually having, having a sculptural destination point where you go to relieve yourself, that's a prototype urine separating compost toilet seat. And so the urine gets captured in a container. You can take it right outside and grow your flowers with it and then bring the flower back in and put it in the vase that's in the back part of your toilet seat. So it's just kind of, you know, how do we put ourselves back in the nutrient cycle and just and, and really appreciate that every time we, you know, we pass something through our bodies. And then I learned about this system called PP Ponics that was developed by Paco Arroyo in Mexico City. He was working with very poor farmers who couldn't make a living on the land anymore. 
and um, were having a hard time feeding their families in Mexico City. So he taught them how to use their urine, uh, you know, creating these uh, boxes that had that were lined. And the bottom two thirds were full of various kinds of carbon, and then the top third had soil. And um, and then you plant your plants in it, and the urine comes in at the point between the uh, carbon and the soil, and it starts to compost the carbon. And what happens is that the moisture wicks up to the plant roots, and uh, the nutrients also wick up to the plant roots. And it's a great way to grow vegetables. And so he was helping these farmers be able to feed their families. So of course we had to do some PP ponics. And so um, that was, uh, it, this one was at a community garden in Emeryville. That was a, a banner from uh, in the city, the convention center in the city. Uh, and then the, the other one, the barrel was, uh, we put a little chance over the urinal so that men could go in and use it. So you're just exploring that that technique of actually growing plants with, um, with urine in that, in that way. And then I, I started really learning about microorganisms, studying with uh, soil scientists like Elaine Ingham and Dr. Christine Jones. And just, uh, it was such an eye opener that everything revolves around microbial life, including you know, digestion in our own bodies. But, um, you know, in, in the soil, it's like the microbes that make it, make it happen for the plants. And so I tried to create a little game for children that would help them to learn about that. So it's called, it's all about eating and pooping, plants in living soil. And so they learn about how microbes basically eat each other all the time. And in the process of eating each other, they poop out soil nutrients. And that's what helps to get your plants growing. So that was a fun project. And then continuing you know, to do art about soil, um, you know, learning about microbes, you learn that it's the, uh, the fungi that are helping to sequester carbon in the soil, get it out of the atmosphere into the soil where it actually used to be. So this piece is called Calling All Carbon Home to the Soil Where It Used to Be. And the, the, one, the version on the left was like an earlier version, but the one in the middle is the final one. So it's kind of like a, a radio broadcasting out into the universe, calling the carbon wow. home back into the soil. And the Marin Carbon Project was a really incredible, uh, incredible thing for everybody to learn about. Um, they experimented with spreading a half inch of composted green waste onto rangeland in Marin County and, uh, and then measured the impacts and uh, discovered that the forage production increased by 50%. Carbon was being drawn into the soil and sequestered in a pretty permanent way there and the water holding capacity of the soil really increased. And what was amazing was they kept testing every year for quite a few years after that. And every year more carbon was sequestered, even though they weren't adding any more compost. So something about putting that compost on the rangeland started this whole action that just kept on happening with more and more carbon coming out of the atmosphere. So they're, now they're continuing that research and they have uh, 17 different areas in the state where they're exploring it. And they're thinking they can just spread a quarter inch of, um, of um, compost and it's just as effective. And then the other research that was really exciting for me was um, into, was the thermophile project uh, with Lawrence Berkeley. And, um, you know, answering the question is like, does hot composting kill pathogens in human earth? Yes, it does. Um, but what about pharmaceuticals? So that was really the thrust of the research was, well, what does happen to all the pharmaceuticals people take? Uh, can the microbes break those down and make the compost you know, beneficial to the soil? And I guess, because my thinking was, well, you know, if we want to try to spread compost on vast areas of rangeland, then we might want to use human herb as a feedstock for that compost. And, uh, so then of course I had to make art about that. So I made my um, human ear compost bag to trying to sell that idea, you know, because I think humor, humor is always a good way to open people to some new new concept. And so, you know, cockadoo to luminar from poo to platter, all about closing that nutrient loop and um, using our poo to save our butts. 
if we can get the carbon out of the atmosphere, we can save our butts. And then, you know, I had an opportunity to host a anaerobic fermentative compost workshop. And it turns out that anaerobic fermentative composting involves way more microbes than um, just regular conventional aerobic composting. So that was really interesting, just learning about that. And, and you can see that this got up to 160 degrees with no problem whatsoever. So it definitely was very effective method. And so I just, I just was always really interested in hunting and gathering knowledge about different ways that people have, have created to, um, to work with you know, wastewater, uh, to treat wastewater. I object to the word waste, but anyway, our wastewater. So, you know, low tech, affordable, small and local. And uh, there's a system that a guy named Tom Watson in New Mexico created called the Watson Wick. And basically, you know, your, your wastewater from your house goes into an infiltrator, that silver thing that you see in the upper picture on the right. And uh, kind of, you know, the microbes work, work through material, the solids get digested in there, but all the liquids kind of go out and go through this pumice, pumice bed and you have put soil on top of it in uh, plants. And so the roots are, you know, uh, processing all the nutrients that are in the wastewater. And eventually the water that comes out uh, in the drain pipe at the end is, uh, is safe to use as irrigation. So it was very exciting to me to discover that some new, a new couple, young people are starting to do Watson Wicks in Latin America. They're calling them Pozo Verde. And um, you can see they're using bricks to create the, the infiltrator rather than buying, you know, uh, you know plastic or, or manufactured ones. And then, and then they use sand to create the wicking bed rather than uh, using pumice. So then another system that really this, uh, I just think it's so beautiful. This young woman passed through town from Chile and she had grown up in, a, in an eco village. And she was building the, the eco village used this system and she built them herself. And it's called, it, it was designed by a professor at the university there, uh, Professor Toha. And this is called Sistema Toha and it uses earthworms. And basically your wastewater from your house or from a couple of houses gets uh, ground up and then uh, pumped and sprayed on the surface of this sort of um, organic material that has a bunch of earthworms in it. You know, you have a big like box thing, that you, you, a structure that you build. And so the, you know, the wastewater gets sprayed onto the top of it. The earthworms start processing it and the, the liquid kind of passes down through that organic material and then through a layer of sawdust, a layer of gravel and a layer of larger stones. And then it's clean enough and clear enough to come out and be treated with ultraviolet light. And then it's used as irrigation. So um, it's, a, it's a, an approved system in Chile and uh, I think it's really beautiful using the earthworms because both the earthworms and bacteria are processing all the nutrients. And then of course, you know, wetlands are another way uh, to extract nutri excess nutrients from water. And uh, there have been quite a few eco artists that actually create floating wetlands to demonstrate how to take excess nutrients and pollution out of uh, you know, what bodies of water. And a famous one is Stacey Levy's spiral wetlands, where you know that, that's just a like a flo floating wetland mat that has juncus planted into it. So the juncus roots are uh, habitat for all kinds of microbes and then those are kind of, you know, consuming the excess nutrients in the water. And this other one on the right is also a floating, floating wetland, even though it's so densely planted. And that's in Finland, the magic of water. And again, it's extracting pollutants from the water. So of course we had to play around with that. So Weed was doing an exhibition at it, uh, Los Madonna's College in uh, Antioch on the Sacramento River. And so we had a class, the students in the class build a floating island. And um, because there was a problem with algae blooms in that lake, because there were a lot of uh, Canada geese that hung out there. So they were pooping around lake all the time. And then 
uh, the fertilizers from the lawns and stuff. It was definitely too many nutrients going into the lake. And sometimes the fish would just die, you know, float to the surface because there wasn't enough oxygen. And you can see the students over there uh, on the left are collecting plants because there was kind of a boggy area at one end of the lake. So there were plants there that already were sort of, you know, accustomed to having wet feet. So uh, those were the plants that we put into the wetlands. So that was fun. And then I'd been hearing about these uh, gray water gorilla girls in town. Uh, and, you know, when you're raised as a, when you grow up as a union plumber, you have a certain territorial attitude towards plumbing, <laughs> you know, a certain kind of maybe elitist attitude. And so who were these girls that were out there that knew something that I didn't know? <laughs> and also I wanted to learn about, you know, anything related to more sustainable ways of doing plumbing. So I finally caught up with them and they were putting out these wonderful zines, you know, uh, and, and the name then changed to the Gray Water Gorillas. And when I started, uh, you know, teaching with them, we were teaching installation workshops uh, where people were installing pre-legal gray water systems. And uh, that worked great. And, you know, we were kind of refining the whole, the method by just teaching them and seeing how they, how they function. And so these were the two main gray water gorillas at that point in time, Laura Allen. And here she is admiring her human air compost. And on the right, we have Cleo Wolf Erskine, who is now a hydrologist and a college professor and still doing work related to water. And, um, as gorillas, we participated in the stakeholder meetings in Sacramento when uh, California's Great Water Code was being revised and updated. And it was an amazing experience. This a very small group here, actually at a couple of meetings that was like standing room only because everyone who knew anything about Great Water came out of the woodwork to share their knowledge because the bureaucrats really didn't know a lot about it. And so people who had actually been installing it and, and knew what worked and what didn't, you know, really, we educated the bureaucrats and they actually came up with a very decent code that was much better than the old one. So the code caught up with us. You know, it, we'd been doing these pre-legal systems and suddenly we're the experts and, um, and respected. And so we needed a new name. So we became Gray Water Action. So. And um, for years, we've been going to uh, conferences about localizing California waters, the whole idea that small local resilience systems are going to get us through climate change a lot better than, you know, our sort of knee jerk thinking that we need huge infrastructure and big dams and big whatever, you know, it's like really looking at what kind of what kind of solutions can we do locally that are more appropriate scale. And the California Onsite Water Associ Association used to be California Onsite Wastewater Association and they were very helpful, you know, guiding me about just learning more about smaller wastewater treatment systems sort of at the home scale or community scale. So then um, I was teaching a little gray water, you know, one hour breakout session at EcoFarm. And this woman approached me and said, oh, would you like to come down to my family's little ranch and cross the border in Tecate and talk to people about gray water? And sure, and so it turns out that her family's ranch is the world famous spa called Rancho La Porta. <laughs> and so um, I did in fact go there uh, and teach, uh, teach about gray water and rainwater reuse. And I realized that was kind of like coming full circle. Like I had originally learned a trade because I wanted to have something to offer if I went you know, to another country or went to you know, another area to really be able to share. So that was really wonderful to, find myself doing that. And I insisted that as long as I was there, we needed to do a workshop and actually install a gray water system, not just talk about it. So um, Sarah, who you see here in the white shirt, the daughter of the founder of Rancho La Porta, gathered a group of you know local guys who were just great. And the three young women were uh, interns at the farm. And uh, we just had a wonderful time putting, to, putting this uh, sort of a laundry, laundry gray water system in. Uh, you know, this would only mean something to somebody who knows gray water, but it's, it was a little bit more ambitious than just a simple laundry to landscape system because we had a swale and, you know, it was, it was an interesting system. 
so and while I was there, um, Sarah, you know, the daughter and uh, this man, Eric, were sitting at the breakfast table planning what they were calling a water healing plant. And um, there's a, there's a, at the Tres Estrellas Organic Farm, there's also a cooking school called La Cocina Ticanta, and uh, or the, the kitchen that sings. And so, you know, we we're having breakfast there every day. And so I was listening in on these plans. And um, so here are, the, here are the protagonists of this uh, treatment plant that eventually happened. Sarah, the daughter of the founder of the ranch, and um, Dr. Eric, whose name I won't try to pronounce. <laughs> and Eric is a Belgian man who was apparently a very successful entrepreneur. He said he had factories making widgets all over the world. And I had a lot of money and fancy cars and hung out in Monte Carlo. And, and, I, it, and one day had a realization he wasn't doing anything to help the earth pull through the crisis that we find ourselves in. And so he stopped what he was doing. He went back to school, got a PhD and started a company doing really interesting green infrastructure projects in Mexico. And Sarah finding him totally made it possible because she trusted him, made it possible for her to proceed with doing these, this really kind of visionary project. So the story of how the, the, heat, the water healing plant came to be is that the ranch is a, a huge presence in Tecate. Uh, it was started in 1940 by the professor and um, and now like three generations of people uh, have worked have worked there same families just keep working there because it's such a, it's so beautiful and it's so such a nice environment and so the ranch in that kind of role of being an important entity in the town actually gave a huge park to the town and did all this incredible stonework that picture on the left is a, a very large ball field. And then there's these plazas and beautiful places for people to have markets or you know, ceremonies or you know, come together and really gorgeous, gorgeous uh, gift to the town. And um, this here's welcome to Las Piedras, the stones. It's the center for um, uh, environmental education. And you can see that kind of looks like a big boulder there in the background. That's actually this incredible educational center that's designed to look like a big giant granite boulder with these beautiful doors, um, you know, with, with stained glass and you go in and you wander through these wonderful kind of like cave like, you know, passageways and it's just, it's a total, I mean, it's just like magical. You come out into the classroom and there are these like beautiful polished fences that look like, you know, uh, rattlesnakes and you know so anyway this this was gifted to the um to the town and uh, the park also has a community garden and it has compost toilets to educate people about that and um, with nice signage and really impeccably built and maintained you know here's how you you pull the bucket out from under the toilet and the composting area and uh, the urine collection and um you know, it's, this is a, one of those urine diverting toilet seats, so the urine gets separated out, like we had talked about before. So, but what was happening was that now the town was asking the park to pay for irrigation water, and this was going to actually be quite a lot of money every year. And so Sarah, being an incredibly the, the daughter of her father, an incredible visionary person, it just started thinking, well, why would I pay for new water to come? Tecate's water is mostly coming from the Colorado River and from wells. And, you know, the, of course, the aquifer is being over pumped as it is everywhere. So, you know, her thinking was, well, why, why would I do that? Why would I be, um, rather than pay for irrigation water coming from someplace else or from, in a way that's detrimental, why not? buy sewage from the town and treat it and reuse that water. You know, water that's already been taken from someplace else or been taken out of the ground, they just reuse it. And so um, in order to create irrigation water, but also create other benefits. So, so that's where she and Eric came together because Eric has this company, Requilibrium, that's all about, you know, creating uh, 
very innovative projects, you know, always starting with the reuse of water is the basis from which all their projects start. Um, it's all about working to rebalance systems, the integration of technology and nature. It's a perfect synergy to create a better world. So, um, and you know, as on his website, he talks about a large percentage of traditional plants in Mexico are out of operation due to their operating costs, as well as their lack of maintenance. Those trotadores, as they're called, uh, take an evasive approach to cleaning water. So instead, his company calls it healing. Uh, healing instead of water treatment because they seek to cure the water instead of adding chemical components or using high energy processes to clean it. So they clean the water in a natural, respectful and passive way, seeking the ideal balance and not to be invasive. So it's just, it's a, it's a nice philosophy. It's a whole different approach to um, handling wastewater. So in their projects, they don't use chemicals, it's passive, there's zero or minimum energy use, no generation of smells, and no discharge of methane. And so their, their projects are especially robust, have low operating costs, <coughs> longevity, and generate renewable energy. And so uh, Eric's company set up an office right there at the farm, the Trace Australia's farm. Uh, in you know an outbuilding there, and you can see they're lovely people. You saw the engineers, came, the men and women engineers, and um, set up shop and started doing drawings, <laughs> doing what engineers do, lots of drawings. And so here's the top view, looking at the the whole plant, you know the the uh, cluster of structures, and then this so that's a long the green stripe is a long wetland that kind of makes a U-turn back on itself. And so that's that's the plant, that's the water healing plant. And here you see it with a, a 3D uh, computerized, you know, views. Again, top view and then side view, a little more side view. And that's a big white bubble is for the, the biogas that then gets turned into electricity. So, and again, here's just another, engineering style, you know, drawing showing the pathway of the gas being going through the processes that goes through to become electricity and the, and the wastewater going through its processes to turn out to be irrigation water. So this is a little easier to see. So the first thing that happens when the wastewater comes in, the wastewater is coming from a part of the town that's just residential. So there's not any industry there. So they really carefully selected the area that they were going to get the wastewater from. So they divert, divert it from the regular sewer, but they have sensors in the sewer that uh, can tell them if there's a sudden flush of chemicals or if there's a sudden change of pH, in which case they would stop. They would stop the diversion. They would, it would shut a valve because they only want the water when it's not going to damage the wetland. You know, it's like they have to protect that system. So, so they're diverting water that they're pretty sure uh, won't be harmful. And, um, and so it comes and it comes at the left on top, it comes in and the first thing that happens is it's treated magnetically. And then it goes into what, what are called the UASB biodigesters. Those are upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactors. <laughs> it's quite the mouthful. And we'll look at what that's about. And then from those, those that goes into biofilters that have green bamboo and lava rock in them. And then the wastewater goes into the wetland. And the wetland continues on the lower level all the way to the end where it <clears throat> comes out and is pumped into the building where it gets some final treatment before it gets pumped up into a tank on a hill where it can be used it, with gravity to go to either the park that was a whole idea of doing this in the first place or to the farm. And then here's again a top view. So those are that's that cluster of the biodigesters and the biofilters and the building is called the chapel. You'll see why in a minute. And 
they, they designed it so they could add a whole other series of uh, treatment modules on the other side in the orange there in case they want to expand it at some point. And here's Eric again, uh, giving us a tour. Uh, the woman is Lauren Elder, my uh, artist friend, and we make mischief together doing art. And so we were there learning about the plants and maybe going to help, you know, offer some creative suggestions for how to enhance it in some way or the other. And the other man is from Portugal. He has a community in Portugal and he's considering, he wants to build a similar treatment plant there. So, so Eric is just educating us about this incredible uh, healing plant that he's created. And one of the things that we were uh, tasked with doing was thinking about how to interpret what's going on here to the public. And so I really like to, especially since we're talking about a nutrient cycle to represent information in a circle. Uh, and so what this is showing, first of all, in nature, there's no waste because everything is food for something else or someone else. So that's the key concept here that, you know, you're keeping things going round and round and round because it's all food for something else. So, you know, we started at the top, we, uh, we humans, we eat plants and animals that eat plants. And then, uh, our di intestinal bacteria actually digest our food for us. And then we defecate and urinate. Unfortunately, we do that into water, which is coming in from outside. Uh, and we burp and fart. Um, and that, so that water in the toilets that's flushing our urine and our, and our poop goes to the biodigester. So that's the first treatment phase that we saw in the other drawings. And in that biodigester, it's almost a mirror of what happened in our own digestive system. So bacteria are digesting the poo and pee in that biodigester, and then the biodigester poops out sludge, it pees out black water, and it farts biogas. So it kind of does the same thing we do, it's just in a little different form. And the biogas uh, rises up to the top of the biodigester, and then it's turned into pure methane, and then it's uh, burned in a generator to make electricity. So. That's one of the products of this whole process. Then the sludge gets removed periodically and composted with the wetland plants. Like you have to trim and prune the wetland plants periodically. So those are composted together and then those are used to grow more plants for food. And the black water, you can see the lines. So you know, flowing around to the left, you see it going from treatment stage to treatment stage. So the black water goes, from the biodigester to the biofilter that we talked about, where the green bamboo and lava rocks do their thing. And then it goes to the wetland. And then the water finally gets treated with ozone and then it's suitable for irrigation. So this is just, you know, uh, producing plants again that get eaten and the whole cycle just keeps going round and round and round, which is the way it should be. Like we're, we're giving what's gone through our body back in a way that's beneficial. To, to the soil and to you know, creating electricity. And this is what it looks like from you know, a drone point of view. So it's helpful to see. So that's the cluster, you know, the biodigesters are the big hexagons, the biofilters are smaller ones, and then it goes through that long wetland that loops around. And at the end, it gets pumped back, the water gets pumped back into the, what we call the chapel. And that area over on the right where it's kind of like the trash area right now is where the composting will happen in the future with the sludge and the, and the wetland plants. So in the biodigester, that's where it's the first real stage and that's where 70-75% of the treatment happens. And um, you can see there's, uh, well, so that's the top view and then there's the sort of computer image on the left. And so there's three separate, separate biodigesters. They're all doing the same thing, but the water comes in and it gets divided into the three and then it goes on to the, the biofilter. You can see those three little pipes poking out at the, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but at the top right of the um, cluster of digesters, there's three pipes poking out. We'll talk about that. So these are the biodigesters being built. And what Eric says is that this geometric shape has something to do with the shape of the molecule of water. Now I looked up the molecule of water online and I couldn't really see how that's 
I don't know, I don't really understand, but I love it that they're incorporating even incorporating geometry and shape and form into the the intention to like really benefit this whole process. So so here um, those three pipes, those three white pipes poking out from the concrete there, the, the block is where the sludge will come out um, from those bio reactors. And the blue handled valves down in the other picture down below, what happens is if you open one of those valves, then the pressure of the water inside the biodigester pushes the sludge down and out. Oh, I forgot to show you. Those drains in the center are where the sludge leaves the, the bioreactors. So it comes out through those and that's where the sludge gets taken to compost for the plants. The black pipe uh, at center top is where the sewage is going into the um, into the hole, starting into the system, and it's it's going by gravity. It's not being pumped. And so here again, there's the black pipe going into the that top concrete area where it will get divided between the three biodigesters, and that uh, arrow is pointing to a magnetic treatment module. And um, they use magnetic water conditioners because it's considered by scientists to be one of the most interesting applications of the 21st century. They use magnetic fields through a series of permanent magnets that allow the physical improvement of water. So the salts and the molecules in the water are modified resulting in better filtration, zero fouling, better absorption of flora and fauna. So I don't know. I just think it's kind of neat that they're incorporating lots of different innovative techniques. So here's that black pipe coming and dumping the wastewater coming in from that's been diverted from the sewer in an, in the residential neighborhood. And Eric was very proud of this uh, way of distributing it. It all goes into the center of that triangle, and then you know would go over would all flow evenly over that the level edge into the three different biodigesters. If they want to isolate one of the biodigesters, they just take these little V triangles out uh, and that allows the water to go to certain of the biodigesters and not others. So it's just sort of a very low tech, rather than having valves or anything, it's a really simple creative way to control which of those three biodigesters was getting water at which point. And here's Sarah with uh, one of the main engineers, Benjamin. And, uh, you know, she, she's like, it looks like she's blessing the water, but um, that's, there's the biodigester empty on the left and then the biodigester filled up on the right. And what you can see is that there are the white pipes that are dividing into a bunch of crisscross. So that, that's where the, the wastewater flows up into the, into the water in the biodigester. And um, and then the water, as it, it cleans, it's being cleaned as it comes up inside that biodigester. Remember in that picture, it looked like it was dug down quite far. As it comes up more and more, the water gets cleaner and then it eventually goes out the holes in that large white pipe around the edge of the top. And um, what's happening, it's called a sludge blanket reactor because it's very fascinating. There's like, the different kinds of bacteria make, yeah, there are these interesting, uh, lots of different sort of, you know, graph, graphics online showing the basic concepts. But so you've got the, if you look at the center one, there's a sludge bed at the bottom where the wastewater comes in. And then there's what they call the sludge blanket. And then the clearing of water goes up and out that pipe that we saw with the holes. But then there's a, kind of like a, a tent-like thing that captures the biogas because as the cleaner water is going up, uh, gas bubbles are separating out and being caught in that little, um, in that kind of tent thing. And what's happening as I understand it a little tiny bit is that some microbes are kind of creating this sort of very, it's almost like weaving. They're kind of like creating this sort of woven mat-like Thing where a lot of other, um, a lot of other microbes can kind of latch on, and so they create like little clumps. They call them uh, sludge granules, little clumps of 
dense bacteria and that that creates sort of the sludge blanket and so any water passing through there basically all those microbes are grabbing nutrients out of it so uh eric said like 70 to 75 percent of the um nutrients are being extracted from the water in this first stage in the biodigester bioreactor uh, yeah And then this is, so this is the little umbrella, they called it, that's going to catch the gas. So the gas bubbles that come up will get caught under that black, this big black umbrella. And then uh, that's going to be attached to see where the black arrow is. It, the top of the umbrella will be attached to the black pipe going around the edge of the um, biodigester. And that will carry that gas over into that big white balloon. So it's just kind of fun seeing these guys actually muscle this thing into place. And this is the gasometer. And we thought that we were maybe going to be, you know, decorating the gasometer. We thought it was going to be a beautiful round shape like the ad, you know, <laughs> the advertising on the left at the top. But it turned out to be this sort of like lopsided thing. <laughs> it's sort of funny. But, um, but that's where the, actually what we're looking at is the outer shell made out of you know vinyl basically uh that then will have another liner inside it that where the gas will have to be contained by the inner liner and as i understand how it works the gas will be pressing against the inner liner and then uh, prevented from expanding any further by this outer white pvc liner and so as the pressure builds up it will force the gas to go through a pipe into the chapel where it uh, goes through the process to be turned into um, electricity. So, so this is called the gasometer. Okay, so the next stage after that bioreactor, biodigester, then the water, uh, the wastewater, the, the black water basically that's cleaner, that, ha that has a lot less, you know, nutrients in it goes into the biodigester, no, the biofilter. And these biofilters have volcanic rocks and green bamboo. And they're the smaller little, uh, the smaller of the um, hexagonal shapes uh, here. And so you can see here that one of the lids, had one, half, of the, half of one of them, the lid has been taken off. Um, and I, I really didn't understand, uh, Eric talked about using the fresh green bamboo that's been chopped and that's put into those and that, and they have to be kept uh, submerged, so it's anaerobic. And they release some kind of enzyme that uh, is beneficial. And so I wasn't quite clear, so I asked him to explain. And he says, the green bamboo enzymes break down the water molecules into smaller elements and more digestible for the bacteria. So helping the absorption of nutrients in the following steps. The enzymes become digestive enzymes. The biofilter does not remove nutrients itself. It performs a digestion function so that plants in the wetlands can remove nutrients more efficiently. And inside the biofilter, facultative bacteria develop and can live in presence or absence of dissolved oxygen. So you can see from these the smaller hexagons here, then it's not too far over there to the beginning of the wetland on the left. So this is the stage that kind of sets up, sets it up so that the black water can benefit from the wetland process better, as I understand it. So this is the next step with the, the wetland that loops around on itself. And the, the idea is that it's um, it's got a small gravel on the top layer and then larger gravel underneath. And the water level is always kept about three to four inches below the surface of the gravel because that's how you keep from any um, mosquitoes growing, or you know, you don't really want animals or anything getting into it. So, you know, keeping the water below the surface is really important. So you don't actually see the water. What you see is plants. And um, so here, here, you know, Eric, uh, Sarah was conducting a tour with her friends, and we're looking at the t the top layer of the wetland before it kind of. Uh, does its U-turn around, and it's to, it's all flowing. The water's flowing by gravity at one percent, and um, the plants have just been uh, uh, chopped. They've just been cut and uh, pruned, and they don't look all that great because at this stage, 
they've only been in for about four months and there are no nutrients. All they are in is in gravel. It's just, so, this is the stage where you're just trying to develop some roots and get some microbes going so that when you do open the, open the valve to the sewage, it comes in and, and this is all ready to go because if you put the sewage in before the plants can handle it, you're gonna get sewage back out again. So it's kind of this dance of having everything ready before you start bringing in the, the actual sewage. So, so here it is again, this is a, a, done, it's done its loop and come out to the end and you see this like green lidded thing. That's where there's a, a very, <laughs> very low tech level control on the uh, maintaining the level in the wetland. And basically Eric is kind of showing you just bend the pipe one way or the other, you know, when it's up like this, it's gonna be longer and the, the level is gonna be up more if you bend it down. <laughs> so, How long does it take? Huh? How long would it take to control drops and control the level in the wetland? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know in the biodigester, it's, it's supposed to be 24 hours at least. So I'm not sure in the wetland. It's a good question. And there you can see the com future composting area over there where the trash is. But, um, so I'm imagining when these plants are actually getting the nutrients that it will be in the water, it's, they're going to be like, you know, a really, it will be a very incredibly abundant looking, you know, planting. So. And what's happening here is that the plants have been carefully chosen for having varying root links because they want you know roots at every level in the in the wetland and um then they've been selected because they're known to be really good at extracting certain things out of water so there's agapanthus papyrus canna tule and vetiver and um and you can see some of them have flowers so it will be very colorful so yeah so you know we were there right at sunset and it was like quite lovely and it's like it's so it's so much not a big industrial you know not like that sewage treatment plant that I worked in as a you know beginning apprentice it's like it's kind of you know but all it's like working with nature you know it's using it's, it's cleaning water the way nature does they're really working with the microbes and 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 enhancing it with you know magnetism and with you know shapes and whatever, and just really helping nature to do what it does, which is naturally clean water, so. So, and I, this is the, um, the building that houses the equipment, for instance, for, uh, you know, generating the electricity. And, um, you know, Eric was, uh, his drawings were was sort of like a garage with garage doors. He's like really, you know, very, utilitarian and Sarah was like no 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 you know like Sarah basically designed most of the buildings and the landscaping at the ranch and it's all impeccably beautiful so this also had to be beautiful and so she just sort of uh, wanted to reference Romanesque architecture and basically drew this little chapel because it needed to have it's all about ventilation because of the equipment that's in there needs a lot of airflow so um, that little steeple, you know, that has air coming in all around the sides. And, and so, um, yeah, and so we were, we were, you know, invited to kind of think about uh, how to enhance the doors and maybe put something, those are big screens at the sides of the doors that's letting air in. And uh, just, you know, really to prompt her own creativity because she's so busy being CEO of the ranch, it's hard for her to have time to think about it. But, so this is inside the chapel. Um, and you can see there's that, there's our uh, gasometer and it, it, the inner liner has not been filled with gas yet because there's no, there's no sewage coming in yet. But um, when there's pressure inside that, the gasometer, the, the gas, the biogas will be pushed into the building and it will go through these big uh, tall red filters, which are basically full of um, metal shavings and they uh, clean the sulfur. There's some kind of sulfur gases mixed in to the biogas that would be damaging to the, the generator. And so um, the filter removes that. And then, and then it's more pure methane and then that gets burned in the generator, which is inside this big green metal kind of thing. And that's just referring back to 
the one of those drawings where it shows that you know from the gasometer inside the building to the filter to the uh, to the generator and to the back into the public power grid. Uh, and there is a if something happens to that um, the uh, gasometer, say it happened to get punctured or something, or there wasn't there wasn't a way to capture the gas that's coming out of the biodigester then that gas goes to what's called a, a, it's like a torch where it gets burned instead of just re releasing it into the atmosphere. It's like an emergency way to, to burn that gas. So it's not uh, causing a problem in any way, but that's only, only if something goes wrong with the system functioning normally. So, so that's the gas pathway as it gets turned into electricity. And then the water pathway, remember we said the water at the end of the wetland gets pumped into the the chapel and there it's filtered in this big uh, micro filter that um, you know, really, really, really cleans out any sediment left in it. And then it's treated with ozone in these ozone container things. And then it's, uh, it's, it's at California Title 22 irrigation um, standards, which is allows human contact. So Sarah, apparently, it, the water would have been fine to use for irrigation by Mexican standards at the end of the wetland, but Sarah wanted to bring it to a little higher standard. Um, and maybe because it's gonna be used for, sometimes for growing food at the ranch, I mean, at the farm. Anyway, so then as we said, it gets pumped up to a storage and then it uh, can gravity feed to the park or to the farm for irrigation. Another thing that was really important in the design of this building, the chapel, uh, is was that it that it have shaded spaces around it because education is really important to Sarah, and so she's imagining having families and school kids and stuff coming and learning about this whole way of cleaning water, you know, and really honoring. Again, it's this whole thing. Well, how do we honor what's coming through our bodies and what we're producing to give back to the earth? And so. She's really passionate about the education part. So it's, there are all these um, shade structures that will be covered with plants. And so there'll be beautiful ar arbors where people can stand and you know, just learn about it. And then uh, on this wall here in the lower left, there will be interpretive you know, signage there. And there it is, that's the, that's the uh, water healing plant. And you know, we came up with some ideas for how to, what to, she could do with those uh, screens on the side of the doors, you know, and came up with some ideas for handles or kind of treatment at the center of the doors and, and played around with, you know, combining them together and what they might look like. And, and we have no idea if any of this would be used, but it was fun for us just to think about it. And, um, and then Lauren created this really delightful little children's book, sort of ex just exploring what happens, you know, what, what does happen to your poop. So, you know, and it's called Las Estrellas because the farm is called Las Estrellas. And um, the three stars, tres, excuse me, is tres estrellas. And so the three stars are the biogas that becomes electricity, the solids that become compost, and the liquids that become irrigation water. So it's waste transformed into benefit. And, uh, you know, they're in the middle of little girls like, well, you know, you flush the toilet. Like how many people really do know where it goes and what happens to it? And then on the right, it's just sort of, I mean, I love this is my favorite. I think my favorite page is the one about, you know, like we, we burp and fart just like animals do. And, and just like the biodigester does, you know, it's burping and farting that methane that's becoming electricity. So it's kind of having fun with that. And then, you know, what about that big, that big balloon? It, it turns out that it's probably not going to be uh, decorated after all, but we're just sort of thinking like, how could we just kind of show what's going on inside the biodigester, you know, the sludge at the bottom and the water getting cleaner and the gas coming up. And then, you know, the interpretive signage, like this could be, this is just sort of a rough map. It's like, this could be made of four foot diagram with a lot of pictures in each one of those little circles, pictures of what's going on, you know, on the wall is really part of the educational process. So this was sort of our little bit of a, our, our dropping creative ideas into the, the pool there. 
And then the plan is actually the plans are going through the building department to build another plant that's 10 times larger. And that one will actually treat ranch wastewater and waste more wastewater from the town that apparently now is going into the river. So Sarah is just like, you know, how to be a beneficial influence in this town and and have the benefit of generating irrigation water for the ranch. And so <laughs> it, was, it was very inspiring to just be with somebody who can is willing to invest you know, to see where the need is and, and willing to invest in creating something that's going to be beneficial. Thank you for hanging in. Any questions? Does it generate all the electricity needed to power the plant? And you know, the plant, that's the, that's the really cool thing about it is that I mean, Eric says it's there's practically no maintenance. It doesn't even require a full-time person there operating it. Basically, the first time that it incurs any need for energy is when you're pumping at the end of the wetland, when the water gets pumped back into the chapel to be filtered and have ozone treatment and then pumped up to the hill. Otherwise, the sewage is coming by gravity. The sewage is going through the wetland by gravity. It's all, it's just all nature doing water running the way it runs. And so it's actually very small amount of electricity needed for it. And yeah. Does it generate all the electricity it needs to burn it? Like burning? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's actually, it's generating electricity that's going back into the, the, the town grid, yeah. And that plant itself, uh, it's a, that plant itself can uh, kind of generate uh, like clean clean the, the water for the whole range or for a, how many houses or something. Um, I don't know how large of an area of that little neighborhood it's doing, but it's um, 2.7 liters per second. The new plant that's 10 times larger is going to handle 27 liters per second. So, and I don't, I don't know liters that well. So I don't, I, don't, I think 2.7 liters is a gallon and a half per second, something like that. No? Uh, it's it's uh, 0.6 gallons or oh. 0.7 gallons. Okay. Second. So it's not a huge amount of water, but it's, this is sort of the prototype for the bigger one. And Someone online asked, um, what's the, why the big bend in the wetlands? Just because of the lay of the land and because, you know, it needed to come back to be near the chapel. It wouldn't have been, you know, if they had ended up with a waterway far away, they would have had to pump it a long ways to get back. So it was more, you know, just made more sense and more efficient and more compact and more, yeah. Does it ever rain here or what happens when it rains? That's fine, apparently. I mean, they only get like 11 inches of rain there, maybe. It's pretty, it's a very dry climate. So, yeah. I don't, yeah. that wasn't ever discussed as being an issue. Do they expect to have to divert the water often, or do they think that that will be much more? You mean to divert the water from like the when, there, when there's too many chemicals you said or when the oh, pH yeah. changes? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't even know what they're imagining would be the circumstance when that would happen. Um, they just want to make sure that because you, know, you know it's so much work to get that wetland up and running and get all those plants functioning, and then to, if you let something come in that would kill the plants, that would really you know be a setback. Do you think like a normal household amount of like soap and cleaning chemicals would be enough to like upset the system? I, I think they must be assuming not because yeah, that that certainly would be part of what would be coming in normal right. sewage. So yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the relationship of it? Yeah, how did they, how did the, how did they get the cow to agree to sell? You mean to agree to sell sewage to them? Well, to the, there must have been somebody there to trust, to build the trust. Um, yeah, well, the, I mean, I'm not sure if you were here, we were talking about how the, the ranch had given a huge park to the city. Oh, right, okay. And they had been getting free irrigation water right. and then they were being charged for it. So I don't know what the negotiations were for arranging to get sewage water. Um, but they already established that. So oh, yeah, I mean, the, the ranch has been there for since 1940. So it's a long history and hires tons of people from the town. So it's, yeah, but yeah. Did it mention the, the water now that you see is all in the residential, but in a bigger project plan, will it be more? You know, I don't know. I don't know because they didn't, they just, they didn't actually talk specifically about that. It's going to come from the ranch and from some of the city sewage, and I don't know if it's going to be a more diverse, um, because it's in a very different area. I'm imagining it's going to be coming from a more diverse part of the town, so it might be more challenging. I, I don't, I don't know if that's a really good question. How, and I know that the intention there with that plant is to have some of the water be actually treated to potable level, so. Not a big like three percent of it or something. Yeah. There's someone else on, on the line asked um, UASD had a constant flow. Was this the case here? And did they consider an anaerobic baffled reactor? What was the question? Well, I think from my reading about UASB, my little bit of reading, the advantages and I I don't I didn't really hear the question well, but um, you can actually so, look at it. But I think the advantage to the UASB is that it produces less sludge than other methods. I don't know. I don't know what an ABR is, so I don't know what they consider. Logical factors that slow the Yeah, sorry, I don't. Yeah, why the Big Bend in the wetland? Because because it made sense to have the water come back close to the chapel, I'm assuming, but also because probably the slope of the land and just trying to have it all work by gravity. <laughs> Slow down. Oh, sorry. Um, Okay. Anybody else? Um, thank you for hanging in. I really appreciate it. I, I really enjoyed making it. So it was kind of like, what did lead me to be interested, to be so fascinated with the sewage treatment plant? I mean, but you know, I've been I've been looking at ways to handle quote unquote waste from us, which isn't waste. It's like. I'm on such a campaign to transform our attitude towards what comes through our bodies and to really see it as really a gift that we want to give in a good way back, you know? So I don't know. I love Eric's attitude. I love his philosophy. I love the, the work that he's doing. So I'm so glad that they're really there, you know? Pardon? Success is the best of <laughs> Well, people can certainly visit Tecate. An interesting thing has happened in the town of Tecate, which is that because the ranch has such a high standard of incredibly delicious food, much of it from the farm grown organically, there are all these, you know, chefs kind of get trained there 
And then some of them have gone off into the town and started restaurants. So Tecate now has become like a foodie, a big foodie town. Like people go there as a destination to have fantastic food because it's sort of like the, largely, I, it's my impression because of the influence of the ranch. There are all these great restaurants. And, and also there's uh, the beer, uh, there's a the Chavesa company there. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, you can go, I mean, at some point, I'm assuming there will be tours available to people from the town or whoever to go and see it, yeah. Do you think they, they want to export this idea like to other, like to communities or even, I don't know, cities like the neighborhoods, we want to develop a new neighborhood and create something like this. Do you think it, the future goal would be that, you know, that there's a project right now, like, and then, Mm -hmm. increase some other well I actually Eric um, made these incredible uh, posters for us because he kind of thought they would be used for educational posters on the trail for people to walk down to coming to visit the treatment plant and I asked him if it's okay to share you know the drawings and stuff that, that a lot of you saw in the and he's like yes we're all about education we're all about transforming people's attitudes about you know waste and so yeah, he's, I don't know how it will happen, but you know, I mean, just talking to y'all is the beginning of it, right? So, so, you know, and maybe in Tony's in Portugal and maybe he'll find people who can do something similar over there for his community. And, yeah. I have a question, I'm on Zoom. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, first, I want to uh, thank you for, for all the work, which includes your artwork, your work, work, and education and all of that. And, and you got me at the first slide with um, honoring the plumber. Um, <laughs> truly, I'm, I'm a union member, so totally on, uh, I really appreciate it, resonated with me. I have three, three questions, but one might be too te technical and you may not want to take up the time. Um, you used aerobic and anaerobic, and I'm not quite sure what the difference is. And how it breaks breaks stuff breaks the bacteria down. Number two, did you say that our human humaner can break down pharmaceuticals? And would that include like like natural sleep aids? A lot. Everyone I know is practically on some sort of sleep aid because they're so stressed out. And I'm I'm curious about does it really um, does our humaner break down pharmaceuticals? And I think I heard you said say that. Um, when you use your urine, and I have been uh, using my urine to fertilize my plants, thanks to Andre, um, but I just pour it on top. I mean, I just, I dilute it with water and, and I thought you said that it should go, you know, you somehow get it in the middle or, or did, I, um, did I misunderstand that? So um, those are my three questions. And um, I, again, I, I think that, uh, you know, if we could get the youth, like get some third grade teacher that would love to come and, and you could, you know, talk to third graders or fourth graders or get this, kids are excited about this stuff. And if, if we get the young kids right now, um, get them to buy in or get excited about this stuff, and I'm sure they would, they would love it. Um, um, just an idea, just an idea throwing out there. But thank you so much for, for this presentation. I'm kind of blown away and speechless too. Okay, let me see if I can remember any of those questions. <laughs> um, um, the PP Ponics was a specific example of um, using urine to grow vegetables in a very controlled container uh, where, the, where the urine was coming in at the point between two thirds of carbon on the bottom and a third of soil at the top. If you're applying urine to a plants in your garden, they say that you want to put the urine onto mulch or some carbonaceous material because apparently in order for it to be uh, turning to carbon or having the nitrogen be in a form that the plants can take up. And here, I, you know, I, I don't really understand this totally, but that you want the urine to mix with carbon. So you wanna put it where there's mulch or leaves or something on the soil. Um, the question about anaerobic and aerobic. Um, anaerobic is where the bacteria and microbes are uh, functioning 
without oxygen. Anaerobic is where they are, um, there is oxygen. And then there's these types of facultative uh, bacteria and microbes that can switch back and forth from using oxygen or not using oxygen. So it's a whole separate class. I mean, you know, microbes are miraculous. They can do pretty much anything, but those particular ones can either be one thing or the other. Um, and the other question you asked. About breaking down pharmaceuticals and or oh, naturally. I was, talking, I was talking about research that was being done with thermophilic composting of humaneur, which means thermophilic means bringing it up to a certain temperature repeatedly to make sure that the pathogens are killed. And, um, and the question that's being looked at is what does happen to the pharmaceuticals? I don't know that there's an answer um, yet, or there, there's, uh, because there's bazillions of pharmaceuticals. So the question is, you know, can microbes basically disarm or, you know, change them into much simpler things? I, you know, it's a really important question because so many pharmaceuticals are being taken in by people. and um, and I, I'm, I haven't tracked the Thermophile project. I'm, I, um, I'm not sure what the status is of it at this point, but it's really important research, so, yeah. This is Patrick here from Zoom. I just wanted to pipe in here. I know that uh, some pharmaceuticals are a big problem for uh, uh, the local wastewater treatment facility here in e at the EBMOD as well, uh, because they also have a big biodigester. Um, and especially things like antibiotics. If people dump a whole bunch of the, the antibiotics down the drain, uh, that can really mess up the, the balance in the biodigester. Um, and then some of the other pharmaceuticals, as you said, they kind of need a heat treatment to be able to uh, break them down. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a solved problem yet, but there's lots of people right. trying to find answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Christina? Yes. First I heard was... that voice. <laughs> yeah, this is Andre. Um, I thought I knew everything you ever had to say. I'm blown away by how much new stuff there is here. You never cease to amaze. Um, and I'm very grateful that Victoria Sawicki is here um, and asked the question. So I just wanted to ask you, Christina, in regard to one of her questions is, I've been putting my urine directly into my compost pile. Is that all right? That's fabulous. That's the very best thing you can do with it because it, okay. it, it, you know, it, it kind of catalyzes, uh, it catalyzes the whole composting process. And yeah. urine does have phosphorus and nitrogen in it. So you're, right. you're yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> Christina, I... <laughs> I have a funny story. My neighbor, who's 87 years old, um, uh, you know, we watched the Giants game together and she had this pathetic looking tree out in front of her house and it just looked like it was, it never wanted to die, but it really was not healthy. So I said, can I use my secret um, ancient formula? And, and she said, sure. And it's alive and thriving. And, and but I never had, I didn't want to tell her because she'd probably freak out, but she might have laughed. She might have joked, you know, she might have appreciated it. But thank you. Thanks, Andre. Anyway. <laughs> so glad you made it here, Victoria. I think you're one of the few from the class that came. And I'm so sad because I think it was such a fabulous presentation. Not That's only the last part, but the all the previous stuff of her previous work and everything she has done. She's just amazing. And I'm so and, glad. And your it. class, Andre, you did notice that I mentioned your amazing I class. Did. <laughs> I did. You've got two other members of your class here. Yeah. Hi, Andre. It's <laughs> Kate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> funny. Hi. Hold on, honey. There you go. Now you can say hi. Hey. hi. <laughs> I'm in your class too. <laughs> Great. Oh, good. Thank you. It's a small world. So this is going to be available. So because I missed the first part. So yeah, I guess it'll be. Yeah, we'll figure out how to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. recorded it. So okay, we'll get it posted somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't know where yet. But we'll let you know. <laughs> 
Did he stop recording already or is he having all this? Okay. Okay. We're still recording. I can turn it off if you want. How are we doing time wise? We're after 8 30, so we're probably way over, but <laughs> I think we scheduled it till 8 30 um, officially. But I, I don't know, is anything happening after this year? Yeah. Are you Zachary? Yeah, I am. Talking. Oh, yeah. hi, Zachary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is probably going to be a great presentation. Okay, well, um, shall we all just call it a night? Bye. Thank you, Zachary, for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Christina. Yeah. Fabulous. Really good. Excellent. Thank you all.